Okay. Um, <laughs> So hello everyone, thank you so much for coming to our Open Publishing Festival event. Uh, today we'll be discussing Lost and Found Futures of Humanities Technology, a conversation about the writing tool Topoi. Uh, I'm Erin Glass, I'm a senior developer educator at Digital Ocean, and I'm also a scholar of academic technology and I will be hosting today's conversation. So thanks again for, for coming. Uh, before we get started, I wanna thank the fantastic organizers behind the Open Publishing Fest, uh, particularly Dan Rudman, um, for putting together this, this festival on open publishing and open education. Uh, if you haven't looked at their schedule, there's still um, many excellent events left, and so we are really thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, thank you again, Dan. Uh, and uh, another thanks is in order. I want to thank Nathan Schneider and the Ethical Ed Tech community for co-hosting um, this event. If you're not familiar, the Ethical Ed Tech community uh, advocates for more ethical approaches to technology in higher education um, with an emphasis often on open. And one of the reasons I'm really glad that the Ethical Ed Tech community is co-hosting this event is that the tool that we're talking about today, I think showcases why ethical approaches um, are not just good for their own, you know, to be good, um, but they also open up more creative and, and more um, diverse intellectual um, possibilities with our uh, technology that we use in academic institutions. Okay, so what is this tool? Um, we'll be talking about Topoi, uh, an interactive writing tool developed in 1979 by Hugh Burns, who was then a graduate student at the University of Texas, uh, studying rhetoric and, and composition. And I'm not going to say too much about this tool because we have Hugh here himself to tell us uh, all about it. But what I wanted to uh, share with you is why we're talking about um, Topoi. So I first learned about this tool when I was a graduate student um, researching uh, the adoption of computer technology in the humanities. And uh, one of the questions I was really interested in was um, how did the word processor, how did the standard word processor that we all use today um, become normalized? Um, and so I was uh, researching the sort of adoption of the word processor in the 1980s. And, and 1990s in humanities departments. And uh, through this research, I was really uh, surprised and delighted uh, to learn that there were uh, many scholars, many educators during this time period uh, that were uh, exploring the use of the computer uh, to support the writing process in ways that were completely different. Um, than we see today with, with the word processor. And so I found this uh, quite exciting, quite inspiring, but also really sad because the legacy of these tools, um, it, it, they hadn't been preserved. And I think if you're outside of the field of composition studies or writing studies, there's a good chance that you might not know about all of these different um, exciting creative projects that were happening in the 1980s. And to me, that, that's a great loss because I think these tools actually, you know, when you study these tools, you realize that they do have a great influence on our educational processes, on our intellectual processes, on our collaborative processes. So um, for me, it's, it's really great to get to learn more about them and think about how we might re-implement these, these um, creative and intellectual processes in our academic technology uh, today. Um, okay, but that doesn't explain why we're talking about Topoi today. I mentioned this talk at a, uh, mentioned this tool at a talk I gave um, at the Bang Bang Conference in February, um, where Jason Orendorf, a, uh, a Mozilla developer, was also presenting and um, to my delight, a few weeks uh, after this conference, Jason had gone and found uh, Hugh Burns' dissertation, found the sort of blueprint for the, uh, the Topoi tool, and had rebuilt it and put it online. And um, lo and behold, now um, myself and anyone that was interested could get to explore this tool for themselves. And I had a really fantastic time doing so, and I think others should, should definitely uh, give it a try after this 
after this webinar. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from um, Hugh and Jason about Topoi. We're going to first turn it over to Hugh, who will introduce himself, um, talk for about 15, 20 minutes um, about Topoi, about his background, about what led him to develop it. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Jason and uh, Jason will introduce himself and, and talk about what led him to want to rebuild this tool and what was the process for rebuilding it and did it make him think differently about um, writing technology or any other thoughts you might have. Uh, we'll save the last uh, 15 minutes for questions. Um, so I really invite any of you um, attending to ask um, Hugh or, or Jason um, about Topoi, about writing technology, um, you know, anything, anything you might be curious about. So um, yeah, thanks so much to my presenters, Hugh and Jason. This is a really just such a treat for me. Um, I'm excited to hear about Topoi. And um, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Hugh. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Jason. And thank you for that bang, bang moment. Uh, it turned out we were on Twitter goofing around and all of a sudden, uh, Jason posts the GitHub old program and it starts making the rounds of my old friends and some of the, I see you out there today kind of logging in to see what happened back in the 20th century. Uh, a shout out for uh, to the Digital Writing Research Lab at the University of Texas, Casey Boyle, who was able to tell Jason that I was alive and, <laughs> and Aaron picked up on it and pretty soon I hear from her as well about how she's enjoying uh, the revival of, of a piece of software written between 1977 and 1979 at the University of Texas in BASIC on a mainframe computer where we had to buy computer time uh, to have access to it with backing from the National Science Foundation uh, to have a direct uh, connection to the, the mainframe computer there. Uh, the manager of that program was George H. Culp, and it just so happened at, in the beginning and in the middle and the end of this story, I'm going to focus on where I was at the beginning uh, with George H. Culp at the Computer Center, wanting to learn more about computer science and how to write code in my discipline, the discipline of problem solving and creative thinking. The title of the dissertation, as it turned out, is Stimulating Rhetorical Invention in English composition through computer-assisted instruction. Rhetorical invention was the, is a process that's pretty well known uh, among the rhetoricians that there are five canons. You invent something to say with topics. You arrange how you're going to say it. You style it. You remember it. And you deliver it. So the five canons are out there. And in the 60s, uh, gosh, a long time ago, there was a rhetorical renaissance going on, and I was happened to start my teaching composition uh, career at the Air Force Academy in, in 1973. And uh, so a shout out to Perry Luckett, who's out there in the audience, because we arrived on the same day at the same breakfast table and figured out we were going to do this thing together. Um, the idea was to figure out what to do in my field, uh, writing, teaching writing, that uh, was not being done. So I took a, a novice programming class in BASIC with George Culp, and I started writing computer-assisted instruction. I started writing haiku generators, syncane generators, uh, little syntactic parsers that tried to answer questions, uh, programs that would teach usage, effect, effect. I wrote a, a series of programs on the opening of novels, have the paragraph of the opening of the novel uh, appear in one screen and put a little editor next to it so people could uh, inquire about that. And from 1977 to 1978, I started presenting at conferences, the Conference on College Composition and Communication, and learned that there was another group of people out there that were doing these kinds of things and wanted to see more done. The most notable person I met during that time in 1978 was Ellen Knoll, a professor at Stanford over at Apple and the Apple's education uh, director that brought on the Lisa. And she said, you, you need to go write these programs in rhetorical invention. In other words, what does a computer assisted instruction say when it doesn't know the answer to something? The 
scenario in the middle was then uh, something we were experiencing in our teaching at the Air Force Academy was that we were having a lot of extra instruction. The, a writer, when they begin the topic, needs to uh, figure out what they're going to say about it. And many times, even now, people come and wait and procrastinate and wait till the very end and say, I don't know what I'm going to say about this topic. So the idea was to kind of emulate sort of a Socratic dialogue, dialogue with someone. Uh, let's talk about your topic for 30 minutes and uh, explore what you might be able to say about it and get the light turned on inside your head through uh, question and response. So very Socratic. Uh, lucky for me, there were a ton of heuristic problem solving strategies out there in composition to get people started. Who, what, when, where, why kinds of thinking, uh, pre-writing strategies by G. Gordon Roman and Janice Lauer. The Carnegie Mellon group was doing all kinds of things with problem solving strategies and schematics about where people were in the writing process. Uh, I would end up exploring uh, Aristotle because uh, my, the book that became my go-to book was written by Jim Canavy, James Canavy, A Theory of Discourse. And along the way, I, uh, I needed to relearn that I needed a, a theory of what I wanted the outcome to be in my teaching. So if I act and I do something, uh, what will the outcome be for the writers? And so I really hadn't thought that through. And Jim Canady one afternoon at a conference in the University of Wyoming on freshman composition asked me if I had a theory for the teaching of writing. And I told him I didn't. And he was able to say, well, here's my book called A Theory of Discourse. Uh, it's, a, it's a mammoth 1970 book about different kinds of aims of discourse, persuasion, referential, exploratory, and different kinds of modes, narration, description, classification. Uh, so it kind of put a frame around it for me. And then I got into his descriptions of for every purpose, informing, persuading, exploring, that there was going to be a particular heuristic, a problem solving strategy that would work with that kind of discourse. And he outlines that. He also says there's a particular kind of arrangement. There's a particular kind of style. And so he laid out this schematic and those of us in the 70s and 80s adopted that. Many states adopted that for the skeleton of their curriculum revisions in public education. That as Lewis Carroll says, no wise fish goes anywhere without a porpoise. So have a purpose, match the purpose to the heuristic, the reading to the heuristic, the study, the inquiry, the journey to the heuristic. So, the middle of the story. I'm at UT. I'm ready to write my prospectus. Uh, I'm encouraged by, uh, to develop a, a larger theory of rhetorical invention, to lay it out. I take three heuristics out of the multitude of heuristics and problem solving strategies for composition. I picked Aristotle's Topoi. Kenneth Burke's pentad, the dramatistic pentad in the grammar of motives. That's in, in, to simplify it, it's sort of the who, what, when, where, why. But it looks at the act, the actor, the agent, the purpose, and the scene of a discourse. Very powerfully aligned with informative discourse. And I looked at something called tagmimic. Uh, rhetoric, which was looking at ways to explore topics, the range of variation, the static views of things, how, how topics are distributed in the field, what are their dynamics. And so I took it on myself to try to sort through and with the help of uh, a pilot study inter and one-on-one -on -one interviews with students, we take about 80 students answering questions in all, all three of those one-on-one -on -one uh, instructional environments, face-to-face, -face, human being to human being. And I took those tape recordings and I uh, programmed them. I wrote what their responses were and I tried to write a program that would ask these questions from that point of view. And what Jason has uh, uncovered is the original code uh, that Aaron mentioned uh, was published in 1979, open, public domain, uh, so people could use it. And the University of Texas would go ahead and distribute that program. 
We had good sponsorship from the National Science Foundation it's through the early 70s through an organization called Conduit that got the word out there. Uh, the journals in my field weren't particularly interested in uh, publishing English language arts with a with lots of computer code in it at the time. So I started publishing in educational technology and my career kind of veered into ed tech. I'll head back to the Air Force Academy after the publication of my dissertation, become the director of speech and composition, stay there for a couple of years, and then begin to get quite interested in the artificial intelligence techniques in human factors. And um, that leads to uh, setting up the artificial intelligence research lab and intelligent tutoring systems for the uh, joint services where I finished my Air Force career in 1989, joined the faculty at UT Austin, where we're setting up the computer uh, research, uh, computer writing research lab with those colleagues there. Uh, we form a small group called the Daedalus Group outside of that lab that goes ahead and pushes the envelope on what publishers might be interested in invention and collaboration. Uh, so, well, it's quite a story, it's quite a story. I will end up drifting even further and become director of educational technology. For once the microcomputer happens and, and the internet happens, then there's a demand for faculty members and students to have a computer on campus or in their offices. And so Smith College uh, makes me an offer to come and be their director of educational technology and figure out ways for faculty members to have computers in their office and all students to have a computer eventually on this thing that was going to be called the internet. So I've chased that down. I go back uh, after a few years of doing pure ed tech and I'm invited back to Texas Women's University where I'm now the chair uh, of the Department of English, Speech and Foreign Languages and with a PhD in uh, rhetoric and uh, the power of language linguistics and literature to be combined into a force for good in the world. When I retired from Texas, uh, a couple of weeks later, I get a call to come back to the Air Force Academy as the Holland H. Coors Endowed Chair in Educational Technology. So I have a full circle in my career. Uh, Topoi, it's based on book two, uh, and chapter 23 of Aristotle's Rhetoric, about four or five pages, where there are 28 enthymeme prompts. The opposites, the cause, the consequences, the public opinion, the private opinion. And what Jason has done is he's gone back and resurrected this interface that goes, goes through this question. I spent three hours on my own program yesterday trying to figure out where we are with COVID testing in the United States going through the, what, how's that going to work? Going through the Aristotelian dialogue. And after you work on this thing, and Aaron, this is what you experienced and told me about, there's about, a, there's about 10 minutes of sheer pain that you don't have anything to say, and then boom, the floodgates open and you start thinking, I, this could be something. This could be something. The light is turned on in my house and I'm ready to say and make an argument and maybe make that private argument public if I do other things like gather more information, verify, validate, define terms, and all those other things that are encompassed in the, in the rhetoric uh, of finding an idea, getting something to say, and then saying it. Hugh, can, can I ask there. you, sorry to interrupt, Rilke, I just want to ask you if maybe you could explain to um, the attendees how the program works, so, since they might not have seen it yet, like how, what's that experience like? With, like when you go in and log in, what, what happens? Well, the interface is simple. You log on, the computer will ask your name, hello, my name is Hugh Burns, and it will say, hello, and then slot, hello, Hugh, and I hope you're having a great day today. <laughs> We're going to investigate a topic. And then it'll ask you, uh, what are you trying to do? Are you going to persuade, inform, uh, explore? With the Aristotle program, we're going to persuade. So you tell that. Then it asks you what the purpose of your paper is. Uh, and you have to type a string in, 144 characters, <laughs> a string, uh, and gives us the purpose. And the computer comes back in a pseudo-fake, artificially intelligent, 
pretty stupid way says, wow, that's quite a great topic you have there. <laughs> or, are we going to have fun exploring that? Or, and there's a set of random responses based on the tape recordings of the, what the students said when I asked them what their purpose was during that time. So there is a human effect to trying to do early AI with string parsers was, uh, makes it kind of phony for a little bit. Then it asks you to, um, after you ask you the purpose, it says, I'm going to ask you to define Aristotle's topics. And there's a set of explanations about Aristotle's topics. There's also a, and you say yes to that. And the second thing is there's a list of commands because this interface just chugs and chugs and chugs and it won't stop. It'll go 24 seven. It does not stop asking questions ever. So you have to learn how to stop it by reading the list of excellent, uh, exclamation point commands stop with an exclamation point that's the one i forgot yesterday after about the first half hour i said how do you make this thing stop for god's sake <laughs> uh, so it just scrolls down through the question the questions are randomized uh, there are about 40 questions uh, that are come from aristotle uh, that are asked over and over you're at you get a chance to explain it's all your prompt to add more your uh, you add more. It asks you if you want to change your purpose now and then. So it goes back and forth in a sort of a Socratic dialogue about your topic. And then at the end, your, um, and here's what the, the great thing was, you had a transcript uh, that was printed out for the students at the computer center, available the next day, <laughs> so that they could take the, them and take their 30 pages to their uh, English instructor. Uh, at University of Texas and say, here are some of the things I'm thinking about. And it was fun to hear what the uh, people who, instead of coming in and saying, I don't have a topic here, I have 40 pages of single space prose of question and answers about my topic. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, so you have to, you have to willingly suspend disbelief. And you have to believe that this is going to be valuable to you at some point. And then you wait for that psychological moment when that cognition starts to work uh, and you're, you're on your own, you're, you're moving yourself forward, you're not being prompted anymore. The idea was to wean the writer from the machine and get them onto the page. In the last few minutes we have before we turn it over to Jason, um, can you tell us what effect you saw this program having on, uh, on students? Did it improve their writing? Did it improve the process of writing? What did you find? The best thing that's happened to me this past week is your invitation allowed me to reread my own dissertation. And that Hugh Burns guy was really smart <laughs> back in 1979. Uh, we have about 67 variables of discourse taken from Kanavi's theory of discourse. Factuality, comprehensiveness, uh, planning, surprise value, uh, cohesion. And we measured those across the groups and between the groups. And so the dissertation statistical apparatus is, is um, quite deep. And we were able to see that the, uh, let me tell you about one of the most telling findings. One is the BERT program uh, wasn't as successful as the Aristotle program in per for persuasive papers because it was trying to inform. The Tagmimic program was mystifying to the 10 English teachers who were trying to read these dialogues and decide whether or not there was any organization there because it's taking the thinking that goes on in the problem solving in physics and dynamics and static and range of variation and field of distribution and trying to make sense of that in some kind of arrangement. So the bridge between invention and arrangement is not built at the end of a heuristic problem solving critical thinking session. That has to be a separate canon and that has to match the kind of purpose that you're trying to do to persuade. So that gap, we never really filled. Uh, so that was one of the major implications. There's more work to do in arrangement style, memory and delivery of discourse, but the invention gave people more than enough ideas. Uh, in terms of quantity of ideas for people who were just interviewed in the control group and the transcripts 
it's hands down. The transcript wins because you're just forced to put out there 30 minutes of your ideas under a controlled situation. Uh, I did have people that used the program uh, who, you know, they learned, they were trained to use it, but they came back to the experimental condition and they wanted just to have the questions. So they never answered any of the questions in the experimental group. They just printed all the questions and took them out <laughs> away and would use them later. So we have some people that never interacted with it. Um, in, so, uh, more than I could ever imagine was there for me to start writing about and talking about, especially as I wanted to improve the, the humanity in the interface. The, uh, the joking around, the fun I have, I'm having today uh, with all of you, and the fun, this community of com the computers and writing community, the computers and composition community is just a blast to be around. And uh, I hope they get a chance to be out there today and maybe see this in the future uh, and to uh, kind of commemorate all the progress we've made in uh, teaching writing with technology. And to, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, so, <laughs> thank you so much, Hugh. That was just fascinating. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions in the, in the discussion at the end to follow up. Um, OK, great. Uh, I will now turn it over to Jason. Jason, if you could just introduce yourself. And then you have about 15, 20 minutes, maybe more like 17 minutes to talk. Um, uh, you can talk less, of course, if you like. And uh, I'll give you a two-minute two warning, uh, and then we'll turn it over to discussion. So Jason, take it away. I bow to Jason. <laughs> I feel exactly the opposite of you. First of all, it's, it's great to meet you, Hugh. Uh, I, uh, so I, my, my name is Jason Oldorf. I, um, I, uh, I uh, met Aaron at a, at a at a conference in Santa Cruz, just like, like two days before the quarantine came down on everybody. Um, uh, Aaron, Aaron's talk in, included um, the programs from Hughes dissertation, just as one slide um, in a, a whole talk that was about the range of, I don't know, Okay, well, my summary of Aaron's talk is that <laughs> is, is, it was about like the whole range of possible computing futures um, and, and how from where we are today, we kind of have a, a narrow, narrow vision of what, what computing has become and what it can be. Um, and it's, you know, it's Facebook or it's Twitter. Uh, but if you, if you, if you go back, um, and and you know take take a step back go go back to old programs go back to 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 research that um, that was that was looking at an unformed field um, you see that there was there was there was clearly a lot more uh, a much much wider range of possibilities there um, and so and, and the Aristotle's topics was just was one example of like of, of that. Um, so I was challenged to recreate this on the web, um, and I picked it up and did it because it was the right size. It was just a little thing that I could do over a weekend, um, and I did not, I did not expect any of 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 what happened next. So, first of all, the program, um, it's, uh, it's. A simple program. It's written in basic, and I was able to just like read and understand it. Um, and that is an experience that I don't have with programs that are written today. Programs written today are written by specialists in programming. They're written by programmers, um, and they just they tend to incorporate tons of other concerns in in the programming language you use in basic. If you want to say something. To the, to the user, you say print, and then you type in the things that you want the program to say. And that's it. Like, you know, you, if you want to say one line of text, that's one line of code. And, you know, for better or worse, we're just like, we're living in a very different technological world today. So it's always, to, it's always to me very refreshing to go back to programs written, you know, 20 plus years ago that are so direct. I'm like, it's, like it's, it's it's such a simple, uh, simple programming environment. Um, and I feel like that allowed a, 
kind of a, I don't know, it, it certainly facilitated this like cross-disciplinary use of technology that is, um, is a little harder today and it, it requires more training. Um, the other thing that surprised me about this program was just how, like for how, Hugh, Hugh admits that like the AI is, it's rudimentary, it's, uh, <laughs> it's dumb. Um, and what really surprised me was just how effective it was at getting getting you to think about. And I, you know, I, I didn't even have a paper to write it. I didn't have, I didn't have anything to talk about this program about. Um, it, you know, it asked me for a topic, and I said, you know, um, basic programming. Hit enter, um, and it was asking me questions. And if you uh, take the program in the spirit that it's intended, and it's just like it's super easy to do that. It's just so friendly towards you. Um, it like it's just prompt after prompt. It's just like, what if you think about it this way? What if you hold, you know, what if you hold the idea this way in your mind and think about it differently? And it was just amazing how I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect to be, I didn't expect to be impressed. Uh, but it was really impressive as well. Just like as an artifact by itself, without any of the, without any of the research attached to it, you know, without any of the, you know, understanding like, you know, who, who the program is actually for, and just like as a, as the thing itself, it was an impressive. Little, Impressive, impressive thing, um, and change the way I think about like how computers can help help people. Um, so I guess uh, the the other thing is that um, technologically it was just really easy to to, to because oh because the, the again the technology that I'm looking at was so simple it was really easy to translate it. Get it onto the web and get it working um, and get it back in people's hands again and that was really exciting uh, i think there's a there's a tendency on the part of technologists or programmers like me to think of technology as purely additive that you know you know five years go by and we have all these new capabilities and things are just that much better and nothing is lost and nothing is nothing is nothing is cast in a different light by that development that goes on but things are really like constantly like we choose this and we don't get that. Um, and we've chosen a very fancy programming world. And so we don't get the, we don't get little, we, we don't get the, um, we, get, we get programmers writing programs. <laughs> and I, I think that, I think that, wow, I would love to see, I would love to see the pendulum swing in the other direction um, and get everybody writing programs. You know, and not you know, not in in a, in in a way that it's not so much like programming, um, because there's you know, uh, uh, all it takes I, I all it takes is one example to see just like the potential that is there. Um, I I I I've been asked to talk for 17 minutes. I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> I can't, can't. I'm not not a talker like you. Um, but I will say that. Because it because this program was text, because it's it's so much about words, and it's because it's just so carefully crafted. Hugh's personality comes through beautifully. If you have a chance to play with this thing, I really encourage you to do it. You can just tell you can tell it's Hugh that wrote it. Uh, I really felt like um, I was shy saying this on Twitter. Like when I, I met Hugh on Twitter just like about a month ago or so. Um, and, uh, and I said, I, like, I hope this isn't presumptuous, but I feel like, I feel like I've been spending time with you, spending time with this program. It's like, you know, I had to, had to type in every line of that program by hand. The, 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 the PDF was like a scan of a scan of a microfiche from like 1982. So it, it wasn't, um, it, 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 it wasn't possible to just like copy and paste that into, into my computer. I had to kind of type it in line by line, which is kind of an old school, uh, feeling that, that that brings back but um but but spending so much time I, looked, I I typed in every word of that program and 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 it it is funny and friendly and supportive and like relentlessly encouraging um and I think that's a part of its success too I think it's inseparable um and it's just so appealing uh, and I'm so glad that I had the chance to do it. 
So I'll thank turn it back so, over. Yeah, thank you so much, Jason. No, I mean, I just can't express how grateful I was when you posted that. It was just like a, a miracle. It was just, I had never expected to get to interact um, for myself with this tool I'd read so much about and sort of just really had wanted to experience it. So that was amazing. And um, I really enjoyed hearing your perspective about about building it and the simplicity of the code and, and the point that you, you made about um, if code is simpler, if our coding environments are, are, are more accessible, that allows for a greater diversity of contribution, right? And that, that's such a, a wonderful point. And I, I'm not sure where to go from there, but um, I'm glad you made that point. Um, I have one short follow-up question before I'm gonna open it up to everyone. Uh, Jason, what, what code did you, did you use when you rebuilt it? What was the sort of technical process? It's amazing that you, you wrote, you, you retyped in all the actual language. That, that's, that's amazing. But yeah, tell us a little bit about your technical process. Um, okay. Uh, I used, I used a, I used, I, 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 so I, again, I, I typed in all the basic um, and I wrote a little basic interpreter that is a program that runs basic programs. Um, I didn't have access to the machine that Hugh used originally for, the, for this. It's, it's um, uh, so, so I, I, I had to kind of guess um, what, what, a, what each line of the basic program would do. I, I, so I wrote a program to, to read the basic program and just run it line by line. Um, and so I was able to, to run it on, on my computer. And then to get it on the web for everybody, I used a programming language called Inform7. It's actually designed for text adventure games like Zork. I don't know, this is maybe dating me too. Like, I don't, uh, 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 so back in the day, there were programs where you would, you would just instead of like having a, a mouse and and like actually interacting in a virtual 3D environment or something, you would you would tell the computer what you want to do by typing in words like pick up the lamp, you know, enter, uh, <laughs> fight the troll, right? Like, um, <laughs> and it would it would be this text text interaction. Well, there's there's actually that there's there are programming languages designed specifically for that now, um, and Inform Seven is one of them. Um, it, it is a programming language specifically designed to make, to make programming a little less like programming for this one kind of task. Um, and so the, like, the idea is that, you know, that depending on what you want to do, um, that anybody can hop in and, and get, you know, pick up Inform7 and, and use it to create a little text adventure game. Um, so so what, what I did is I translated all the basic code into this language. Um, and then fiddled with it a bunch and debugged it a bunch. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I found any bugs in the original. It was, uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty solid. Um, I, had, I had plenty of bugs in, in my version because I didn't, didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, so that's the, that's, the, awesome. that's the technical lowdown. Sorry. Awesome. No, that was fascinating. That, that was really interesting. OK, well, thank you again, um, Hugh and Jason. Let me open it up for, for questions. And of course, that includes Hugh and Jason. You can ask each other questions also. Um, um, and yeah, just, just go ahead and unmute yourself. If, well, is that inviting chaos? We've, we'll try it. Unmute yourself and, and uh, This is Perry Luckett talking. Can everybody hear me? Uh, old buddy of Hughes, I actually even helped him edit his dissertation in 1979, so, or thereabouts, so you kind of have an idea of just how old I am. It would have been 50 uh, times as long. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I signed in here to uh, talk was two things. Uh, first, just an observation. When I first started playing around with uh, Hughes materials, uh, it taught me as a teacher of composition, and I went on to have a career actually as a business and technical editor, business writing and technical writing editor, uh, have edited about 30 books in uh, technical subjects and so on. But I did a lot of seminars uh, with adult learners in corporations and that kind of thing. And what happened with me with uh, Hughes Topoi was uh, I was not a rhetorician. Uh, I had some training in composition, but 
largely in literature and uh, continue to teach literature throughout my career. And I learned what questions to ask writers in practical situations uh, to try to get them to develop their ideas better, even in writing something as simple as an email or a memo uh, or a business letter. Uh, this is the sort of approach that most people don't take in seminars for adult learners. They typically uh, have a set of standard materials, uh, teach uh, before and after examples, and more or less, you know, guide people through in that way. But uh, because of that, I, I hope and I think I was more creative as a business writing instructor because I was able to ask certain questions based on what I had learned from Hughes' program. So that leads me to a question. And that is, is this tool and tools like it, and Jason uh, could weigh in on this too, uh, do we have computer tools available that teach teachers as much as they do students? Because I think in this case, a lot of times I see young teachers come into the classroom less well prepared than they might be to do this kind of work. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can expand, you know, yes, the student pursuing a subject, that's, that's an excellent application, but also the teacher pursuing a way of teaching. Yeah, good question. So I throw that open to whoever wants to talk. Thank you, Perry. Nice to see you in here. Looking forward to when we can be drinking buddies again. Indeed. <laughs> the, uh, it's interesting to find out that the teachers weren't teaching invention uh, in classroom settings. So this was an opportunity for them to go through the process and the teachers that were involved in the experience uh, in, the, in the various experimental procedures in 79 were uh, having to come back and add to their component uh, an invention sequence. So this is 1977 to 78 when we're actually in the freshman composition uh, programs at the University of Texas. Uh, the freshman composition committee had to uh, invite me into the classrooms because Rhetoric was not at that time uh, a main part of the UT program. And so if you were studying with Jim Canavy, we went over to English education. So that's where I would end up. And when I got to the English education office, they were preparing teachers to teach. And we had, uh, you know, collaboration was, was we had lunch, lunches trying to figure out how to help each other get through the PhD programs by developing our lesson plans figuring out what pedagogy is and what it meant. Uh, so, yeah, you, you learn by doing. You learn, you learn about helping students by teaching those students one-on-one. -on -one. As my career developed uh, and I started designing and working on uh, intelligent tutoring systems for all kinds of disciplines, orbital mechanics, uh, blood gas ventilators, um, avionics and F-111s, uh, there are different problem solving domains have problems. But the one thing about training that I learned uh, along the way after 20 years in the Air Force is that after you learn something, you get one stripe. And we can look at that one stripe on your sleeve and we say, we know you know that, all right? And if you take this next set, you get two stripes, we say, whoa, much respect you know some more. So we have ways of measuring uh, an outcome, an effectiveness when we want somebody to uh, change, uh, uh, you know, do, work on a test stand for an avionics test stand. Um, so there are ways of, of helping people learn and visually seeing that. So I'm kind of, I like to think about measuring. I don't know if we figured out how to do that yet. I see some of you out there have been involved in this uh, more than I have, but I guess that you learn by doing so going through these experiences one-on-one -on -one with a learner uh, informs, informs the teacher. Thanks, Hugh. Um, a question for Jason, if I, if I could ask. So first of all, I'm a big fan of, of Hughes. And also, I don't know, I might be the perfect audience for this panel because I teach the TOEFOI on a regular basis and I enjoy reading computer source code particularly old computer source code. In any case, um, this, the first question, I guess, or maybe I'll just one for now, is for Jason. Jason, so you typed in all this basic by hand. 
Did you have a favorite uh, a favorite section, or was there a gem that that really grabbed you from it? That just you, you talked about seeing Hugh's personality throughout this basic, but was there was there a moment that really really made you smile? Well, <laughs> what what I always show people when I show off the program is that very early in the program it asks you what your topic is and you say what your topic is, and then one of the possible responses it can give is that oh, like oh you're like holy electronics that's a huge coincidence i used to date a computer that was fascinated with that topic I'm obsessed with that topic so um the, like the that that joke it's like it's the best it's the best joke in the program um uh, and so that's that's what i always show everybody to like kind of get the spirit of it across um in terms of like is there a favorite oh I don't, like not, nothing comes to mind offhand, but I just I typing in every line. It meant typing in. There are about thirty or forty different questions that the program can ask, and you know, typing in all of those, and then then for each question, there's an explanation of like what's actually going on here, what's underneath the question, what are we really getting at, um, and. Just like going through all of that, it, like it it reveals the depth of thought that went into it, and that was my real takeaway. Is is I don't know. It's 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 a it's a like it's an underneath, and it's like experience of going through the whole thing part rather than having a favorite bit. I like reading old programs because they're direct. Um, I think if if you look at tools for teachers and tools for education that are being created now, I think there's a focus on covering lots of material, which is fair. I mean, right? Um, uh, there's a focus on video because it's engaging in uh in a in a, in a in a kind of in an irresistible way uh whereas something like the the aristotle topics program is engaging if you're there for it right you just you just have to you have to suspend this belief you have to um you have to buy in enough to 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 do a few exchanges um it's a diff very different kind of experience um but what strikes me about it is that, that the kind of material that's being developed right now is actually less interactive. It's, it's more canned and the, the, the programming effort that goes into it is all on other things. It's all on things like, okay, how do we create a website that can handle 10,000 users in a, in a, at a time? Which is a, you know something you never had to worry about. Um, uh, so I, I think like where we, where we've decided to focus our effort uh, is in a way really disappointing to me. <laughs> um, and uh, but the, you know the upside of course is that, that then like to see this old program is just like really refreshing uh, and wonderful. I have a 15 second response to Mark. Nice to see you. Fight on, Mark. <laughs> uh, the US, I first learned the term rhetoric at the University of Southern California from uh, Ross Winteroud, uh, who came into a linguistics class that I was in and said, uh, there's this thing out there you should know about uh, called rhetoric. And he invited me to find out some more about it because I was steeped in literature at the time. And uh, so that's where the journey sort of started. There was also a wonderful climate at USC to go out and do, uh, if you needed to work on a project and do uh, bibliographical editing, you actually were invited by the faculty members there, Mark carries on this tradition of going to the Huntington to edit Yates and things like that. So getting your hands out there, doing the one-on-one -on -one projects in that, in that USC program carried on and carried that spirit along. Uh, I did not write this program over a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> my tech clear. This took about three years. Uh, I did have on the weekends, I had the whole mainframe to myself. I locked myself in on two NSF uh, terminals that were hardwired. The deck 10 could hold uh, 
30 customers at a time, time shared. I had to go out with my little beggar's hat and beg money because I'm a graduate student begging computer time. So I go around and say, if you're not using your computer time, I will take your computer time and plug it into my account. So it was partly groveling and partly luck that that happened. Susan Wittig uh, had written a program called Dialogue. It's seven modules uh, published by Conduit uh, uh, that preceded me there. And she's the one who had those uh, terminals arrive at the, the writing center at UT. But when I arrived, they were dusty and dirty. I found them, I clicked one on and it went straight to the mainframe. And so I got off my modem in, in, that I had to sign up for two days ahead of time and came over there and put bookcases around those two uh, hardwired terminals and spent uh, the rest of my life there for three years over a weekend. Come on. <laughs> Good job, Jason. You know, this is sort of a revival in, in how personalities can, uh, should be visible. You know, the ethics that you're working on, Aaron, in uh, your scholarship about ethics of educational technology is, is so hot right now and magnified because of this kind of crisis we're in in education right now because of this pandemic, uh, pandemonium. So, ah, my goodness, lots to do, you guys. More questions. I had a question. Um... Uh, I'm Lisa Taliaferri. Um, I have a background in the digital humanities, and I was really interested in this conversation, especially around how programs like this could increase diversity in tech. And I was wondering if um, you all had any thoughts about how you might adapt something like this from writing pedagogy to um, technical pedagogy instead. Like, what, could this be used to help people learn coding could it be used to help people like ramp up in technology as well want to take a whack at that jason yeah, i'm thinking i i'm i again i i my my background is not not humanities or education so it's 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 a as much a I, I guess as anything i think that the um hmm. I don't know. Technical education is really difficult. I don't. I don't the the uh, there of course is like really great work that was done in the seventies and eighties on 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 cr creating environments for experimentation and play and teaching technical skills that way, as opposed to I don't know more traditional uh, drilling and instruction. Um, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, uh, there, I just, I, I do think that there need to be, there's, there's, there's a gap, there's a gap between the kind of environment you get in something like Scratch, the, the MIT environment that you can easily create an a, a, a interactive visual game or something like that. There's a gap between that and and more practical environments where you can put a program that can do something in front of somebody. Um, I, I I think I think there's I think there are I, I think there's a, a, a niche to be filled. Um, I don't know what form it would take. I'll pick up on one thing that. Uh... Aaron was talking about in terms of the uh, the tweet, tweet on publicizing this. You talk about philosophers, Aaron. And uh, when I had the opportunity to talk to people that are just beginning uh, their first workshop on your campuses about beginning their doctoral program in whatever discipline they're in, uh, I say, you're going to be a doctor of philosophy. So what is philosophy? Uh, philosophy means you're going to have uh, at least seven theories for how the world works. You'll have a theory of uh, physics, uh, of the natural world. You have a theories of, of logic, of reasoning under conditions of certainty. You'll have theories of uncertainty, reasoning under rhetorics. You'll have a theory of beauty in your discipline, poetics. 
uh, you'll have metaphysics. There's a spiritual component of trying to figure out why, where did that come from? And then you'll have two other responsibilities that Aaron is researching. You'll have a public responsibility. So you have to do the politics of the discipline. And then you have to do the ethics of the discipline and write those things. So philosophers classically wrote these seven books. The uh, metaphysics, the physics, the logic, the rhetoric, and the poetics, and supplemented it with a book on politics and a book on ethics. And Aristotle stuck in two books on ethics because he didn't believe the knowledge of the mind was as much as, as the knowledge of the heart, which I wrote to Aaron this morning when I was drinking my coffee. So it is, so I drift into technical training and the other disciplines. And what I find there is, oh, let me talk to the experts. Let's develop expert systems. Let's talk, to, let's do some knowledge engineering. Let's find out what the experts know and let's re-engineer that into the system. So we have an expert domain. Let's find out what the instructors know when they're teaching it. Let's put that into the system, the instructional domain. And let's see what students do when they're interacting with that and build student models of understanding, misunderstanding, error, type one error, type two error, and see what happens when those three modules interact. That discipline is called intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, and we have a series of volumes that came out in the 20th century on the design of intelligent tutoring systems as these things became embedded within the kinds of programming. So now when you're working on your smartphone, you will know that if you are interested in a shirt at a particular company, that the next four days you're going to get advertisements for that particular kind of search on sale because we've been able to make these models respond to individual choices that people make and make visible in this network of network knowledge. So the disciplines are available, but I think it starts with the experts, pulling the expertise out, representing that expertise, and then searching that expertise. Everybody should be a philosopher. Thank you, Aaron. you're on the right path. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, on that note, um, we are just before the hour. So I just want to give a tremendous thank to you, Hugh Burns and uh, Jason Orendorf for sharing um, your talent and expertise with us today. There's so much to think about. I really hope we can um, continue this conversation um, about the future of humanities approaches to technology. Yes, Hugh, yes. Just one more thing. Uh, yes. Kind of research going on right now and that's cross-generational mentoring. Uh, it's we're working on that in our various disciplines. How do Ment how does mentoring work across the generations? This has been an excellent example. I hope to share this with others who are investigating that within our community at the National Council of Teachers of English and the uh, Conference on College Composition and Communication and my wonderful community of computers and writing group. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jason. Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll post Thank the video you. somewhere uh, online soon and we'll do our best to get the word out. So thank you again and, and hope to, to keep, keep talking. Okay. <laughs> Bye.